this is the story of a failed project and how even out of failure can come something good. I have this crazy idea that I want to work on and I want to combine two different crazy ideas into one meta crazy idea. Yeah, so a few years ago I got involved with this form of photography called lumen photography. And lumen photography is all about exposing black and white photo paper to a scene in a camera for a long enough period of time that there is an auto-developed image that forms on the paper without the need for a developer. And the reason why this is interesting is because if you stuck it in developer at that point, it would be completely black. It would turn completely dark, it totally overexposed, blown out. So you don't develop the paper and therefore you can't really fix the image because to fix it would remove the auto-developed image from the silver. So it's kind of a fragile medium. It can't be left exposed to light, so you can't really show the image directly. You have to do things like scan it, temporarily expose it to a brief amount of light long enough to scan it, and then make a digital image out of it. So it is kind of a hybrid process in that way. Then the other part of what I'm doing is um, I had to decide what kind of camera that I was going to use for this. You know, I have a wide variety of different cameras, but what I found works well for lumen photography is a uh, relatively fast lens. You need a lot of light to cause the scene to be auto-developed onto the paper. So there is a gentleman in Spain, Jorge, who has been working with lumen photography for quite a while and he's actually been selling little wooden or cardboard box cameras that are these lumen cameras and uh, I've uh, had the pleasure of using several of his cameras and these are really wonderful cameras in their simplicity. The process works a little bit faster if you wet the photo paper with water first and you stick it in there and there is a fairly fast f3, f4 kind of lens, simple meniscus lens. You sit it out in a scene for like 15 or 20 minutes or however long and then you bring it back inside and open it up and you'll have a magic image appear. Then when you scan the image and invert the tones, you'll actually have a little bit of color on black and white photo paper because the various halides when they auto develop they will form some kind of a color and so I've had some really interesting color shifts and not color in the sense of realistic colors there is an image and it has color other than black and white and grays so it's pretty cool the camera I'm using though is not a camera with a lens it is a light pipe array a light pipe array. So a few years ago I come up with this idea that I call the pixelator camera. It's an optical method of making a pixelated image on photo paper or film and each pixel will average the light of the scene coming into it to form some kind of an intermediate gray scale. This represents a cross-section of one of the pixels there's a whole grid of pixels. This is the front of the pixel screen and this is the film plane. So you have to imagine that there is a thin grid of these pixels and each pixel is optically isolated from its neighbor. You have a lens system that's projecting uh, an image onto this translucent screen in the front and let's say the lens image forms some kind of a coherent focused image on the front of the screen. It might have an edge, something like that. Let's say hypothetically there's a sharp dealing between the dark parts of the image and the light part of the image. But what happens inside the cell is the light from both dark and light portions it bounces around and by the time it hits the back of the cell it's all been averaged into one gray scale image. And this gray image is kind of an average of the light and dark image parts of the original scene. And so what you end up with ultimately is a pixelated image that uh, looks digital but it's strictly optical. And it's optical enough that I don't even want to call it analog because that's that's kind of I think a bad term. It's not there's nothing analog about it. It's just optical. Uh, but anyways, that was the genesis of this idea. And then what happened from there is I had this other crazy idea that 
if you had an array, a bundle of tubes, and each one was a light pipe that allowed a little pixel, a little spot from the scene to go through the, the pipe and hit a spot on the film behind it. And if you had a whole bundle of these tubes, and if they slightly diverged in angle, you could collect light from a scene and focus it down, not really focus it in terms of refractive focusing, but you could concentrate this bundle of little beams down onto a film plane and have a pixelated uh, image each little tube sees just a portion of the scene and it averages the light level of what it's seeing into a spot. And so it sort of would work similar to the pixelator except it's more of a telephoto effect, if you will, and it doesn't need an optical lens to project an image in front of the array. It forms its own image. So that is the camera that I'm using right now with the lumen print method and on my watch right now I have about 15 minutes thus far so another five minutes and we'll be able to take the camera back inside and see what we get if anything okay so I've slightly overexposed the image here just to show you but that is my Rev Zero uh, initial model of the light pipe array and it exposes onto a four inch square piece of paper in the back it's actually more like a three inch image but anyways it's just sitting there doing its thing. It's getting pretty close to the end. And I'm just exposing a little scene here with some brickwork and some plants and a brick wall. Nothing very interesting, but I want to see what we get. So unlike traditional light-sensitive materials uh, that you use developers on, with the lumen process, uh, it takes a long time, or bright light, to get any kind of a color change. And so I can bring the camera inside under indoor lighting and not worry too much about fogging. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and open it up and see what we get. If anything, it's just a little cardboard lid. And then there's like a pusher plate with a tape hinge. And this is the water soaked or wetted photo paper. And we'll see what happens. It's maybe a little wet still. Okay. Ah. Well, it's certainly interesting in color mode. So it has an interesting orangish brown tone. The image in this camera does not invert unlike a, a normal lens. So you have a dark area up here, some light areas, which are probably the brick wall. This is probably part of the plant sticking up, and this down here is probably the uh, brick that it was sitting upon. So very low resolution image, obviously, very, barely recognizable, but the principle seems to work good, which is very interesting. I guess you would call this photography. So I would call uh, lumen photography on its own, even with a glass lensed camera, to be a very ephemeral form of image making. There is very little about it that is traditional. You end up with an image that is still light sensitive. You cannot display that image. You have to keep it in total darkness and you can only briefly expose it to light in order to photograph it, which you then make a positive image out of. And just to show you what it kind of looks like to look into the back of the light pipe array without any ground glass even, but you can see, so the tubes diverge outward from the back or converge from the front toward the back. But if you look up at the top edge along the tubes and along the side edge, you can kind of glimpse that you can see all the little parts that make up the whole scene, little individual bundles of light coming through those tubes, which are coffee stir sticks. And then this light pipe array camera is highly experimental and in the way I've configured this little gaffer's tape and cardboard and coffee stir stick camera is barely functional. There's, um, there's a place to put a four inch square piece of paper in the back, but there's no shutter. Both of these individually are very ephemeral forms of photography, but when you kind of combine them together, it's right on the cusp of being so highly experimental that it's almost nothing at all. And yet there is something here and it looks like it I need to get it in back in the darkness, but there is something here. There is an image. 
Not sure what it represents, how significant it is, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a photographic image. And that's what's interesting. Well, that first uh, lumen print was on Ilford Multigrade RC Warm Tone Paper. I have another one going now that's on Arista EDU Ultra Glossy Paper, and it's a grade 2 paper, fixed in, in contrast paper. So uh, I've wetted it with water, and it's right across the table here. I'm just doing a little shot of the uh, patio chair and the wall behind it. Keep in mind that this camera is only 22 pixels by 22 pixels, so 400 and whatever pixels that amounts to. Uh, yeah, very low resolution. It's so low a resolution that you can't really discern objects unless they are very simple outlines against a lighter or darker background, so like silhouette kind of images. It, you really can't discern any other feature. So. Uh, one of the things I'd like to try with this is portraits. I think it would be fun. What interests me about these two processes together is it really represents uh, an abstraction. It's right on the cusp between total abstract imagery and uh, more representational photography. So the light pipe array camera itself provides a high degree of abstraction. There is a lot of pixelation going on and uh, it's so pixelated in fact that it's at this low resolution and barely discernible. And then the lumen process itself is very low sensitivity and ephemeral and fleeting and, and uh, not permanent unless you keep it in the dark and so there's these multiple levels of abstraction at work here and that's one of the things that fascinates me is we're working right on the cusp of representational photography and some kind of abstract imagery that's appearing as if by magic on the paper itself and it's very interesting so right now my light is, there's sort of partly cloudy afternoon and the light is sort of fading in and out between sunny and cloudy. So the exposure, I'm going to probably let it go for maybe a half an hour at least to make sure the water droplets completely dry on that paper before I take it out and we'll see what happens. Well, I've waited about an hour. It is kind of partly cloudy out here because of the afternoon clouds. And there is our little camera, so eh, an hour. We'll see what it looks like here. Let's go grab it and take it inside. Okay, just here in the kitchen. Let's just open this guy up. One-handed, of course. So there. There. A little bit of moisture still in there. Let's see about this. Oh, it's kind of almost a purplish color. And uh, you really can't see much. The chair is kind of here, and I think you're seeing a little bit of that paisley pattern on the chair. And this is probably the wall, the courtyard wall, and the sky up here is darker since it's a negative image. But almost a purplish plum color to the droplets. The front surface is pretty much completely dry. There's only a couple little droplets. Okay, so we have two examples of the lumen prints made in a light pipe array camera. And uh, instead of scanning them on my flatbed scanner, I'm going to just go out and do an easy little method with a smartphone. Okay, for any iOS device, to do this, you first go to your settings mode. You go to general settings, accessibility tab, display accommodations, invert colors, and do smart invert. Select smart invert. Okay. And from there, we're going to go use our camera, and we're going to take a picture of the uh, lumen print. Well, I really like the tones of, of this first image. There's an interesting little shading going on because of the way I took the photo. The illumination wasn't really ideal on the print, but nevertheless, I do like the way those orangish brown tones kind of inverted into this kind of cobalt blue and then the highlights here is some of the uh, light reflecting off the brick wall and foreground you can't really see much there's a plant there but 
very enigmatic and kind of mysterious and moody. I really like all the subtle little colors and shadings that you get because of the paper drying, uh, the water drying on the paper as it's, as it's being exposed. Okay, this next shot is very cool. So you can kind of make out the shadow of my courtyard wall. This is kind of the corner of the wall up here. And one side is light, one side's in shadow. And then this is the chair back that uh, the camera was pointing at. And this little detail here, the dark and the light, is kind of that paisley flowery pattern on the cushion of the chair. Keep in mind this is, after all, black and white paper. It's not sensitive to the whole spectrum of colors, but you do get this color shift when you invert it that sometimes appears to look like actual scene color. But it's interesting, you're right on the verge of being able to make out an actual image, which is very interesting. I think the contrast between this process and uh, conventional photography with one's phone, which is how most people engage in photography today, the contrast between those two is very striking, and uh, that's part of what I enjoy about it. It's highly mediated, it's highly subjective, it is fleeting, it is highly dependent on the nature of the materials, and interacting with the environment and the results are very unpredictable and ephemeral and so it's just the opposite of being able to snap a picture on your phone and boom have it instantly available shareable etc something about that appeals to me I'm not sure why but it is a huge counterpoint a huge contrast between that and what most people today know as photography and that's what to me makes it so fun well this is that first camera that I made and it's a bundle of 22 by 22 black coffee stir sticks they're about maybe a little bit less than an eighth of an inch maybe close to a tenth of an inch in diameter and they're about six inches long and uh, this camera was just made from cardboard and black gaffers tape the front panel that looks it that is curved started out as a flat piece of cardboard that I had to drill all these holes in <laughs> and with a drill press and then feed the plastic stir sticks in and then have them converge down into a solid bundle in the back so it has roughly like almost a maybe a 50 degree angle of view uh, so the opening back here in the flange is 4 inches by 4 inches, but the actual image area is closer to 3 by 3. But it's not really square, it's because they're, they're curved. Just the way the tubes come together, they kind of make this, this curve shape. We're working right on the cusp between abstraction and representation in this process. And a lot of it has to do with what one's intended purpose is for a photograph. For most people, photography is representational. It, it is to document a thing, a place, an event, people, or whatever. It's a documentation thing. Uh, for me, though, the purpose of this is a lot more fleeting. It's really about the nature of light itself and how you can direct these little bundles of photons down these tubes to strike some paper. And if you do it long enough, they'll make individual little spots that somehow magically remain under just the reaction between the water and the light and the emulsion in the paper. Nothing else needed. It's just fascinating. Uh, it's, it's its own thing. It's, it's not photography for the purpose of documentation or representation even. It's more subjective than that. It's really a document of the interaction between the light and the materials in the camera uh, in itself. So that fascinates me, that abstraction, that pure, in the purest sense of photography, uh, it being writing with light, photography, light writing. That's literally what we're doing with this process. I want to tell you the saga of the, um, the coffee stir sticks, the cocktail straws. So I went around to a bunch of stores in my area, local area looking for these kind of tubes. You know, there's a lot of the little white coffee stir sticks that are actually two little tubes together and they're white colored. I didn't want that kind. And so I wanted black. And the only kind I could find at my local store was these diamond brand cocktail straws. And they're, 
six inches long, 170 count per box. And uh, I found them, I think, at my local Staples. So <laughs> I bought out the entire stock of one of the stores and then came back the next week and they were still out of them. So I had to go to the, one of the other stores in town and buy out their entire stock. Well, I was making an 8x10 and I figured I needed four or 5,000 straws. And so I have a whole shoebox still full of coffee stir sticks. And this isn't nearly all of them because a lot of the others have already been put into the follow-on camera. Well, this is the follow-on camera that is only partially built. And it's built on a wooden frame. So the front of it is a mask or a grill of cardboard. It's thin cardboard and I've drawn, hand-drawn a grid of t holes and I've had to um, hole punch all these. So what I did, this was actually strips of cardboard and each one was narrow enough that I could use a hand hole puncher. I have a hole puncher that punches eighth inch size holes, so it only has a certain reach. And so the strips individually were narrow enough to where I could use that hole puncher. So I did a bunch of hole punching uh, sitting in front of the TV. This is back, I really don't know when I started this. Uh, I gotta be honest with you. I think it was back maybe in 2010, nine years ago. I don't know, could have been a little sooner. But anyway, I was remember sitting in front of the TV <laughs> cutting all these holes out and then uh, of course those holes become the guides for feeding the stir sticks into and what i'm using in the back to support them is one of these plastic mesh sewing grids it's kind of for some kind of needle point or some kind of sewing kind of craft the square holes in this grid are slightly too small the opening is so i have to use a drill bit to waller out the, each one of the grid holes by hand and then I can feed the straw through. And I found that I needed to make a fixture to enable this to work. And so I had made some brass fixtures. So if I can remember how this works, it's been a while since I've used this. So I have a, uh, a little brass tube with a handle here and I have an intermediate size tube that fits inside that one. It's actually a rod. And then, no, it's a tube. And then I have an even smaller one that fits inside that one. And I think what I do is I, I use the very smallest rod and I feed it through the holes in both the front and the back side of the grill. So let me just get one going here like that. Okay, so it feeds through the front and the back side. And then I think I take a straw, like this one, and I think what I do is I stick it onto this tube, and then I start it through the hole, the hole in the mesh until it's on the brass tube there. Then I put the next one on the next bigger one on and I push it through. And you have to be careful about it in the front so you don't push out the cardboard. But it pushes through like that. And then I push it through enough so the back end of the tube is even with the rest of them here. And then I can pull out both tubes and there is another tube installed. So I sat in front of the television for months doing this. Now, this design does have a converging light cone. It goes from 8 by 10 in the back to something like 11 by 14 maybe in the front. And as you can see, I haven't completely finished it. It was 65 by 52, and that is 3,380 pixels. Oops. You know, I am amused by the thought that there is some regional distribution manager for Target back about eight or ten years ago who was wondering, scratching his head, wondering to himself, what is all the cocktail, why are all the cocktail straws being purchased all of a sudden? There's like a huge run of them in Albuquerque. 
<laughs> what's that about? Is it some kind of drug paraphernalia? Is it, what's going on there? He, they probably contacted the DEA or something, you know. We have a run on coffee stir sticks in Albuquerque. This was probably back in the time when, when the Breaking Bad TV show was being filmed here. And so there was probably some connection with it, right? So I think it's going to take me a long time to put these back in the box. Okay, it's taken me a while, but I got them all organized parallel pretty much. So now I have a piece of cardboard. <laughs> That'll hopefully keep these in order. Okay, well, I have some of this printable vellum, and I've taped a rectangle of it to the main part of the array as it's been built. And uh, I got a couple bright video lights, a pair of them, so I think this would be a good opportunity to test the resolution of this. So try not to fog the screen with stray light. But anyway, as you start in close to it, you can certainly see each individual light. And uh, then as you pull back, you can still see I'm about three feet away, and you can still see each individual light. And now they're getting fainter, and they're starting to merge together. So I guess when I say that this was a failure, I guess what I really mean is I couldn't just make images really easy with it. But I suppose looking at this test I just did with these lights, you can still discern the two lights, even pretty far away, right? But you're not going to be able to discern much more detail. It remains to be seen. Um, yeah, it's interesting. The other thing I notice about this, I'm not so sure of how straight all the tubes are. I think when they go from the front grid to the back grid, there may be a little bit of bending happening. And that bending is significant because it means that the light bundle is no longer just going straight through. It's really reflecting off the inside walls of the, of the tubes. And the tubes are shiny, uh, they're smooth, but it's black. And so you're only getting, you're getting a lot of loss, I think, on some of these. So yeah, it, it doesn't seem to create an image like I had hoped. And I think a few years back, I threw an eight by 10 sheet of photo paper behind this thing and temporarily closed it up with a piece of black foam core and exposed it and I didn't have an image. But maybe I need a lot more light and a lot more contrast in my images between the light and the dark in order for this to work. So that's another whole question there. And that's really part of the reason I think why I never finished it is because the amount of work required to finish this is out of proportion to perhaps the potential for it as an image creation device. And so while it is a curiosity, <laughs> in the end, I didn't see the benefit of this as I had hoped I would, but maybe I need to revisit this. Maybe I need to go back and work with it some more. I think as a creative person, it's really important to play. The, the, uh, the thing that we get from experimentation is things that you don't really know what you're going to get until you do it. You can't predict it. By nature, it's unpredictable. And so we have to allow ourselves time to, to play, to experiment, to tinker. Even if it's a failure, that's part of the discovery process, right, of creativity, is every time you do something and it doesn't work, it tells you something, a piece of information, and it's going to lead you down the road toward doing something later that is going to be more productive. So the whole process of tinkering and experimentation is part of the creative process. And I encourage you guys, stay creative and pursue your wildest, craziest thoughts. And that's what led to this project. Well, until next time, you guys have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye.